In our first video on the worst jobs of World War II, we discussed seven examples, but remember, this was war, and there were many, many terrible jobs you could be assigned, or as some of our viewers pointed out in the comments of that last video, volunteer for. In this video, we're going to discuss four more jobs that would have sucked in World War II. Let's dive right into this with human torpedoes. Now, a human torpedo wasn't a literal human being launched into an enemy hull, and there were, in fact, many types of naval vessels which fell under the broad, if a little inexact, category of human torpedoes, with some being more dangerous than others. Some of these vessels, such as the Italian frogman's Maile or the British frogman's Chariot, and some, such as the Kriegsmarine's Marder and Biber, had more in kind with submarines, but there were some which had much more in kind with unmanned torpedoes. These were the most dangerous by far, if not suicidal. The Kriegsmarine's Neger, upon which their later model, the Mardau, was based, was dangerous indeed. It was comprised of not one, but two torpedoes, one in which the pilot sat and one which was the actual warhead, slung beneath the former like an under-over shotgun. Unable to dive, the pilot steered the Nagar over the surface of the water and then released the bottom torpedo when he was on target. Sometimes, the pilot would get caught in the explosion. Sometimes, the bottom torpedo would fail to detach, propelling the pilot into death's maw, and sometimes, his craft would straight up capsize when it first hit the water. Some 200 Nagas were produced in 1944, and while they were used in some effect against the Allies in the Normandy landings, very few returned from deployment, and between 60 and 80% of all pilots perished. The Imperial Japanese Navy's Katen, on the other hand, was the kamikaze craft of the sea. Katens were based off Type 92 and Type 93 torpedoes, and while some early designs allowed for their pilots to bail out at the last second, this feature was eventually phased out, and pilots literally drove these vessels to their doom, albeit to not so great an effect as the torpedoes on which the Katens were based. While Katens managed to down some US Navy vessels, such as the USS Missinua and Underhill, claiming a total of some 200 Allied lives, more than 100 Imperial Japanese Navy pilots steered them to their death and a further 15 perished in Caton-related training accidents. As Catons could only dive so deep, the submarines carrying them were limited too, and this made the submarines easy targets, resulting in many more Caton-related deaths. In an interview, Japanese veteran Toshiharu Konada described how he felt training as a Caton pilot. After arriving at the Caton base, I was thinking about my death for two or three days, but gradually I became calm and finally I could decide. What made me decided was the thought that Japan would not be protected without changing myself into a bullet. Keeping to a maritime theme, sailing in a merchant navy was another of World War II's more dangerous jobs. Merchant navies are merchant fleets registered to specific countries, and the crewmen of merchant fleets, such as the US Merchant Fleet Marines, are, to this day, considered civilians in times of peace and military personnel in times of war. While the US Merchant Marines, Canadian Merchant Navy, New Zealand Merchant Navy, and other merchant navies served in World War II, the British Merchant Navy was the largest, with some 185,000 seamen in its collective hull. Of these, up to 37,000 were killed in enemy attacks, while a further 10,000 were wounded or taken as POWs. The death rate of Merchant Navy crewmen was between 25 and 27 percent, higher than any other branch of the British Armed Forces. And this can be attributed to the cargo which the fleet was carrying. Without Merchant Navies, belligerents like Britain would have fallen short of raw materials, fuel, weapons and ammunition, food, and other essential wartime resources. And these fleets were often poorly defended, lacking both the firepower and shielding to repel and absorb enemy attacks. This combination made them pretty juicy targets, especially for German U-boats and aircraft. 
US merchant mariner Spud Campbell described the sinking of the Liberty ship SS Henry Bacon after it was hit by a torpedo launched by a German aircraft on the 23rd of February 1945. The ship was mortally wounded, and the captain realized that. He started giving orders about launching lifeboats. Spud was then put onto one of the few undamaged lifeboats with some Norwegian refugees old men, women, children, and even babies, and he described what happened next. We saw the ship as it slid into the water, the captain still aboard. 26 of our crew who had to go down into the water were drowned and frozen. And notice that Spud said had to go down, because these brave mariners gave up their places on the lifeboats for the refugees. Eventually, three British destroyers came to the rescue and while all the Norwegian civilians survived, 16 merchant marine crewmen lost their lives to the sea. We covered body recovery and disposal in the last video, but stretcher bearing was worse in many ways, as the wounded men carried on stretchers were often in absolute agony, and the medical personnel bearing them had to do so through the thick of battle, shielded by little more than the clothes on their back and their prayers. Also, the distances for which stretcher bearers had to carry the wounded were often great and over less than desirable terrain, and during this gruelling transit, many of the wounded in their charge would die, making the entire effort in vain. A stretcher bearer in a unit of Britain's Royal Army Medical Corps Field Ambulance wrote, We evacuated men shot in the lungs, feet, abdomen, men shocked and one crazed with nerves, starting and crying at every sound. Conversely, a young British officer of the 17th Field Regiment described being rescued by stretcher bearers. I noticed two bullet holes in my wrist. It was bleeding freely and the bullets had cut through a vein. I found out later that this bullet had entered the back of my leg. The stretcher bearer said that I would have to go back to a main dressing station. I had seen stretcher bearers in action in Tunisia and had always admired the way they had conducted their difficult and dangerous duties. Having both wounds bandaged, I was then helped onto a stretcher. We started to descend the very steep slope of the ravine, trying to carry a wounded man in a stretcher down a slope steeper than 45 degrees was almost an impossible job and after being moved about 5 yards, I said stop, let me get off and try walking. The young British officer then managed to walk the rest of the way to the dressing station, but he finished by writing, How I would have managed without those two stretcher bearers, I have no idea. Stretcher bearers were knee deep in the dying and the dead, but at least they were in it together. And this brings us to our next, less than ideal job of World War II, sniping. The reason why snipers make the cut is that infantry feared and hated them, and due to this alone, they weren't treated so well when captured by the enemy. See, roaming the land, often deep behind enemy lines and perching for days or weeks in wait of a target, snipers gathered vital intel on enemy positions and tactics, and they also held in their heads vital intel which could prove useful to the enemy. And the best way to get all this intel out was through torture of course. Torture which more often than not continued on until death. Soviet sniper Tatyana Baramzina suffered such a fate after parachuting in behind German lines near the village of Pekelin in Belarusia. After shooting holes in 20 German soldiers, Baramzina was reassigned to caring for the wounded, performing this duty in a trench that was soon assaulted by the Germans. Baramzina was wounded in this fight but she wasn't killed and the enemy seized her. Simply to find out what unit Baramzina was from and how many troops were in that unit, the Germans gouged out her eyes, after which they shot her point blank with an anti-tank rifle. It's unclear what else they did to Baramzina, but her body was found mutilated almost beyond identification. So those were another four of the worst job roles of World War II, and while there were plenty more, we're eager to extend our worst jobs videos beyond the scope of World War II, possibly back to the Great War or forward to the American War in Vietnam. Also, as one of our viewers suggested, we might even flip this whole thing on its head and make a video on the best jobs of World War II. But as per usual, we're interested in what you guys think. Are there any jobs you think deserved a place in this video? Would you like to see a video about the best jobs of the Second World War? 
Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as per usual guys, just before you go, make sure you check out all those juicy links in the description below. Because if you want to join our wider community, you can check us out on our Discord where you can chat with other history buffs like yourself and check out all the sources for every single video we post. And if you want to help support the channel more than you already are by watching this video, please do check out the Patreon as well. Every dollar does help contribute to the quality and quantity of videos posted on this channel. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.